Welcome to Digital Hospitality. I am your host, Sean Walchef. This is a Cali DVQ Media production. Every single week, we talk about our ongoing thesis, and that is digital hospitality. Every business needs to be digital first, and every business needs to be in the hospitality business. What exactly does that mean? We are a barbecue brand that became a media company on the backs of the smartphone. So it's not just the iPhone, it's not just the Android. We learned how to market ourselves, how to brand ourselves online so that we could sell barbecue. And now we're creating media content. But we have this show so that we can bring on people that are playing the game within the game. If you're listening to this podcast, if you're a fan, you've already understand what our thesis is. You believe in it. We believe a rising tide lifts all ships. We can't do this thing by ourselves. So we wanted to create something where we're going to bring on the best of the best, the people that are playing the game within the game to teach you, but also to teach ourselves on what is working, why are they doing the things that they're doing, and how are they empowering business to move forward. Today, we have a guest, Don Verbriggi of Jotful.com. I, ha- I was fortunate to be on Don's podcast earlier mm-hmm. uh, this month. She does a phenomenal job, but more importantly, what she's building for small business owners is the thesis. It gets to the heart of what we talk about. We talk about smartphone storytelling. We talk about the importance of video, the importance of audio, the importance of written word, and the importance of images, creating content to tell your story. No one else is going to tell your story. You need to put that on all these different social platforms. But more importantly, you are an e-commerce company. You have to be digital first. If you have a brick and mortar business, yes, you want to sell things to your village. Yes, you need to take care of your village, but the village is much bigger because of the internet. And we have the Mm -hmm. expert here. Don, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sean. And um, I think that we are the ones actually who are very grateful to have had you on the podcast. You were an excellent guest and I think people really benefited from hearing your inspirational story. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Well, I want to talk about your inspirational story because I'm, you know, we're fortunate. We've done, you know, hundreds of podcasts. I've been on hundreds of podcasts. First of all, you are a phenomenal host. I've never had so many details like Don just did (laughs) above and beyond. Literally, I've never felt so prepared for a podcast and on the technical side, on the operational side, on the story side, she cares about her craft. And I know that she cares just as much about all the people that she brings in as Mm. clients. So please Mm -hmm. tell me, bring, bring me back to working for your mother. Yeah. Bring me back to the bridal shop. Yeah. So I I grew up um, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan in a small village, and my mother opened a series of businesses. In fact, she and my father currently own five small businesses. So they are entrepreneurial. That's entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, right? Yeah. I I can't remember a time when we didn't know the difference between profit and revenue in my household, right? It's just like (laughs) part of the language growing up as a kid. And so you can imagine that we as kids supplied a lot of free child labor yes. for our parents' businesses. In fact, I remember, Sean, actually, uh, one time the local newspaper did a best of series and they had best bathroom. And my mother's at the time flower <laughs> shop was rated best bathroom. And my sister and I were so proud because we cleaned those bathrooms every weekend. No for way. Our That's allowance. so awesome. How cool yeah. is that? So that's how we grew up, right? And then you know, I went I went to college and I studied graphic design. And then I, I practiced graphic design and then I switched into marketing, which is really just kind of becoming the client of a graphic designer. And I did it at the same company. So it kind of happened overnight. You know, on Friday, I was a graphic designer. On Monday, I sat on the other side of the table in marketing. So I pursued this career in marketing. And then ultimately, I went to business school and I got an MBA. And you can imagine with a background like that in graphic design, marketing, and business, I was then asked to do even more free yes. labor for my, my parents' <laughs> businesses. Yes, yes. Just a different kind of labor, you know, yes. more thinking. Intellectual yeah, labor. Intellectual labor, exactly. Yes. So my mother opened a bridal shop. So she had this flower shop, but she eventually converted it into a bridal shop. And she she needed a logo, she needed a website, she needed all all the things. And so I would work on this stuff and it it just got to a place where I started to have my own life and my my own family. And I didn't wanna spend all my time doing all of this free website design and redesign for for my mother. And I started to realize that for small business owners like my mother, 
there just weren't great solutions out there for her to get a website, build a website, and then maintain it on an ongoing basis. Because not everybody has a kid who, who's a graphic designer and can yep. take care of this for them. But, you know, people will hire designers or freelance designers or agencies to build a website for them. But when we talk to business owners today, I can tell you, they're all being quoted exactly the same price. Do you want to yes. have Please a Please tell me. I love it. $5,000. Unbelievable. $5,000. That's and we, we laugh, we laugh now when business owners tell us how much they've been quoted because it is always five thousand dollars across the board. Wow. And it's just, you know, for a little bridal shop like this, spending five thousand dollars on a website, it's just it's unaffordable. And then once the website is launched, you have to go back to the agency all the time to get changes made, and you're paying on an hourly basis after that. So it just it doesn't make any sense. So then the, all of this do-it-yourself software came up, right? I'm yep. sure, Sean, you're familiar with WordPress, Squarespace, sure. yep, all, all of that of stuff, yep. right? All that DIY mm -hmm. software. And they're great because a lot of them are really drag and drop. You kind of build your own website. But what they did take into account is that for business owners, again, like, like my mom, you, frankly, you have to have the time Yes. to learn how to, to use this software. You have to want to learn how to use this software. And you really have to have this combination of online marketing, technology, and um, design skills in order yeah. to actually be able to build something that you're confident will work for your business. Correct. I, I talked to a business owner recently and he had built his own website. He built it on Wix, but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. They're all similar. He built it on Wix. And he had it for a year and his subscription was running up and he, he started talking to us because he was so embarrassed about what he built that even though he had made a website and paid oh, for no. it for a year, he didn't tell anybody his address. Oh, <laughs> he no. didn't put it on his business cards. He didn't put it in his URL or on his, uh, on his emails because he was just too embarrassed by what he made, right? So, yeah. you know, for a lot of people, this is just really intimidating. You don't have the skills, you don't have the time, frankly, you just don't want to do it. You want somebody else to take care of it for yes. you. So that's what the landscape looked like when I was, you know, working on my mother's website. And I said, you know, the classic entrepreneurial thing, <laughs> there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. If, if my mom is struggling, their chances are in the neighboring village, the bridal shop has the same problems. Exactly. And so does the barber shop, and so does the law firm and so do the restaurants like this is a small business problem. Yes. 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 It is a universal small business problem. So I said, well, there must be a way where we can get the content from the business owner because nobody knows their customers and knows their service better than the business owner, right? Yes. Can we get the content from the business owner, plug it into a platform on their behalf? So we actually build the website on their behalf and then we co-maintain it with them. So they do the easy stuff themselves, like yes. if they want to you know, change some words, swap out a picture, like that kind of stuff. They don't have to go to someone and pay hourly for that to be done. But we do the hard things. Like if they want to add a new page or something like that, and we take care of all the tech. So they don't have to worry about how a web host and a domain registrar and a content management system connect. I mean, we don't, we never even use that kind of language, right? Yes. It's very plug and play. And this way, they're able to get something that is effective for their business and they can feel confident about, but is also affordable. So we charge, we start at $59 a month. So it works amazing. out ultimately to be about 10% of what you pay an agency. Yeah. It's and it's ongoing amazing. service. I mean, it, it's so fascinating with me. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. Everyone that listens to this show, they know how much we care about your digital presence online, yeah. and sharing your story online, but also what you said was language. And I think mm -hmm. that's something that we focus a lot on and we try to simplify language. And it doesn't yeah. matter what industry you're in, whenever you start to use complicated words, that's when people start charging more money. If you're in yes. the legal profession, if you're in the insurance profession, we all flower these big words so that you don't understand what you're paying for. And digital mm -hmm. marketers especially are guilty of this. Social media okay. marketers are, are guilty of this. Social agencies or content creators are, we're all guilty of this making it more difficult than it needs to be. And what you're doing and your company is doing is you're providing the tools, but also the partnership. 
you've mm -hmm. literally become a partner with these small business owners to yep. empower them and encourage them. It's one mm -hmm. thing to empower them. It's another thing to be, have a partnership where you're encouraging them to build out their online presence, their digital. I mean, I looked on your website and I'm doing research for the podcast and it says uh -huh. there's 4.6 million businesses with fewer than 10 employees and half of them don't even have a website. Yes. Forget about a mobile responsive website. Forget about yes. a mobile first website. They don't even have a website. Yes. Why yes, is that? Why is that a failure out of, and, I mean, b besides the obvious, let, let's, and to let's be honest, unpack that. Uh, some of that has improved as a result of the pandemic, right? Okay, we have good. seen more companies come online, which is great. But the thing is ultimately, and I know Sean, you focus a lot on all of the different marketing channels that your yes. business can use. Ultimately, all, most of those channels are rented. You yes. are accessing other people's audiences. And the goal with those channels is to really bring them back to a place where you can begin to own that audience and build it as your own audience. And so your website is really the place where that happens. So you drive the traffic from social media, for example, back to your website, you get them on your email list, and now you really start to own that audience. And having the website is the place where you can actually tell the story in a complete way. Because if you're posting on Facebook, for example, that's just ephemeral. The yes. post goes up at two o'clock in the afternoon. Frankly, by the time they get home from work in the evening, it might uh -huh. have completely gone down their feed and they just, they never saw it, right? Mm -hmm. And you're also up against the fact that some of these algorithms deprioritize posts from businesses Correct. unless you're paying. Correct. And so then you're paying to access that channel. Like if you're paying for it, drive it back to your website, try and capture their email address. So now you can have a conversation with them on an ongoing basis. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fascinating to us. And I'm so happy that you talked about it because it, it is so important because mm -hmm. people are starting to wake up. The pandemic has woken up a lot of business owners to understand in the restaurant space, especially yes. that Instagram is important, that it's not mm -hmm. just Facebook, but also I need to, what is TikTok? I need to actually figure out what TikTok, what short form video is what we like to break it down is we remove the logo and we start to figure out what's the storytelling platform. Is it audio podcasting? Yeah. Is it video? Is it YouTube? Is it TikTok? Is it Instagram? Instagram reels? Is it images, you know, which Instagram used to be, mm -hmm. or is it words? And it's crazy to me how many business owners are so great at telling their story. Like literally you became mm -hmm. a small business owner. You became an entrepreneur. You had to sell the dream to someone first, most likely a loved one, most likely a friend, mm -hmm. most likely someone was going to invest. You sold the dream. I have this idea of a product. I have this idea of a service. I, there's a problem. We need to fill this problem. And yep. they do, and you build this shop and whatever mm -hmm. product or service you're selling, you do such a great job convincing the village, convincing the other businesses, why you're a great shop doing community work. But then when it comes to selling your story online, mm -hmm. you're not capturing the content, not capturing what, but then some people do do it and they put yeah. it on Instagram, but back to what you say, every single day, these businesses are posting on Instagram, literally blogging on Instagram, mm -hmm. if they took that blog and they put it on their website, what kind of SEO traffic would they get? Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I, I think that a lot of business owners also don't understand how important the web is as a discovery channel. And this is especially true for restaurants, Sean. So I, I think I, I behaved like a lot of people did during the pandemic, which is that I picked a few of my favorite restaurants and yes. I frequented them. I said, these are the ones that I want to make it right. So I chose there were three restaurants that I just go to all the time. And one of them is this Thai restaurant. And one day I went to, to call them or, and I, I tried to go to their website off of Google My Business. Yes. And I clicked and the website link was broken. It had been hacked or something, or somebody had somebody had grabbed their domain. They let it expire. And so I I had to figure out how to call them. I had to try to find yes. a phone number for them. And so I called them and I placed my order and I showed up and you know, I asked what happened and they said, oh, you know, it looks like our, you know, our domain expired and we forgot to renew it. We need to fix this. I said, yeah, you really need to fix it. And guess what they never did. And Sean, they went out of business last weekend oh. and I was oh, so, 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 so bummed out because it was kind of preventable. I think yeah. that how many people, I mean, I, I jumped through a bunch of hoops to find their phone number so I could give Correct. them a call. How many right. people didn't jump through those hoops, right? How, it, it, the fantastic Thai restaurant. I really miss them already. Yeah. But it's you, you have to just 
remember that it is a discovery platform for people. And if you're not there, then they can't discover you. They can't find you. People are not going to jump through hoops to come to your business. They're just not. So I love getting back to you. You're with your mom. You're building mm -hmm. this out. This is when the idea, the aha moment comes. Yeah. Tell me about the struggle. Tell me about you have the aha moment, but tell me about the the tough part in the hero's journey. The part that you know most people we don't talk about. The the part where you're you actually have to convince people. You actually have to build a team. You actually have to get this this idea off the ground. What challenges yeah. did you face? All right. So this is a this is a software as a service business, and yeah. I have a fair amount of experience in this industry. Right prior to this, I had been the VP of marketing at four different uh, software as a service companies, um, all of which were venture back. So seed, series A, series B, series C. So pretty, pretty well-rounded. And then I was the COO at one of them before I started this company. So I had a fair amount of experience. That said, when you come in as the VP of marketing, you're always coming in at a point where a bunch of things that already have already been figured out. You have what the tech industry we call product market fit, which is yeah. to say that the early team, the founder and the early people who were there have figured out exactly which niche in the target market they want to go after first. And they have built a product that satisfies the needs of those users and they have happy customers and they have case studies. And then you come in as the marketer and you take all of that work that has already been done and you begin to scale the business. That's what I had done in the past. This is completely different when you're starting from zero, nothing, yes. zero customers. And this was so, so, so much harder. It started off easy because in the beginning, you're building the product. I actually was able to get the first customers pretty easily, just leveraging my marketing background. I really hustled and got those initial customers. And it was around customer number 90 that things started to get really hard. In fact, going from customer 90 to 100 was hell really? <laughs> it took months it took so much longer than going from zero to 90 had right we, wow. we really slowed down and and it's because what happens is when you grow you don't grow in that kind of you know hockey stick linear exponential way that you always see in charts the way you grow is really stepwise right so you start by selling to your friends and family oh mm -hmm. those are easy low hanging that's easy low hanging <laughs> fruit it better be <laughs> <laughs> oh, it ought to be, right? If, if you're doing it all right, be. If, you can't it close, if you can't close them, then <laughs> you might have the wrong product. Exactly. So you start with, you know, your, your very, very close network, the people who are kind of doing it to support you. And then you realize, oh, crap, I have to figure out how to sell the people cold, right? Yeah. And so you go out one level out from your, your network, right? So now you're stepping out one, but maybe you have people in your network making those referrals out, right? So it's not totally cold you might be getting a warm intro but it's people you don't know it's still strangers and we you know we were able to do that to about 90 and then once we got to there it was like oh my gosh now what we yes. have exhausted this immediate community how do we grow beyond that and so I really spent about two and a half years two to three years working on figuring out what the growth engine for this business was going to be. And keep in mind in the past, coming in as the VP of marketing, I always came in when they knew what the growth engine was. And my job was to fire it up and run it. Yep. This time I was trying to figure out what it was. And it was so oh, hard. And my God, Sean, I would make lists of possible things to try, right? Why don't I try creating a meetup group? Why don't I try this cold email outreach? Why don't I, and I just come up with these lists of things and then I would start testing them and I would test them in a way that was as inexpensive as possible yep. and as quick as possible so I could get some data and try and find out what worked. And if something seemed to be working, I would double down on that. And I get really excited when things seem to work and then they would stop to work, stop working. <laughs> they were, they would prove not to be scalable. And I, sometimes I tell you, Sean, sometimes I would go back to my list and there would be nothing left on it. Right. And then I would just walk around the neighborhood. <laughs> I would listen to podcasts. And I, you, you know, as a founder, as a CEO, I'm sure a lot of people on this call are business owners. Yes. Um, if you don't have a partner, it's really, really lonely. Yes. Because employees are not the same as partners. They don't take on the same level of risk that you do there. You don't want to stress them out the way you as the owner are stressed out. And so yes. that can be a lonely walk around the neighborhood, especially in Michigan, where it gets cold in the winter. Um, 
And so that's what that process was like. And then ultimately, you know, just kept digging, you know, doubling down on something that was working and then ultimately figured it out. What, so what, what ultimately ended up working? I mean, was it a combination of things? Usually is, right? It's never one yeah, thing. It, it is actually, uh, let me explain the evolution because I think that the evolution is really interesting. So we had figured out that when I would speak at events, uh, we would get customers. And I would frequently give this talk called how to get your small business online. I would lay out what you and I talked about at the beginning of this, of this episode, Sean. I would say, look, there are three ways you can get a website. You can hire a designer agency to build one for you, but it's expensive. You could build it your own yourself, but then, well, you have to build it yourself. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Or you could get what we call a do it together website. That's what we do at Jotful, right? I would give this talk and people would listen to it. it. They would be able to figure out which of those three solutions made the best sense for them. And some of them would call us up and say, hey, yep. and they would come in and they were already kind of pre-qualified because they already understood the landscape and knew that Jotful would be well, a good fit for them. You. They trusted and they, you. Yes. They trusted me because you know I had provided this educational advice. Mm -hmm. So- when the pandemic happened, I, these events dried up, right? And I said, well, I wonder if there's a way I could turn that into a video. This yes. is right up your alley, by the way, Sean. You're probably thinking, right. you, <laughs> would, you would have thought of this from day one and it well, took me no, about no, two years. Absolutely not. I mean, it's a 13 year barbecue media journey for us. So, <laughs> I mean, we, we're, we're just getting loud about short form video now because, yes. of, because of TikTok, literally because TikTok made us uncomfortable. We started testing the platform and then now mm -hmm. we found that it works on all different types of platform, but video, please keep going. Yeah. Okay. So I said, well, why don't I turn this into a video? We can host, we can have uh, video events over zoom, right? Yeah. So we started doing some of those and it kind of worked, but I thought, okay, this is not scalable. And I can't sit here and do this event every single Tuesday at 2 PM or whatever it was. Right. I mean, yeah. I didn't have time. I didn't have time to keep repeating that. Well, what if we made one video and kind of edited it and made it a little bit nicer and not did it live, not done it live. And then we could use that and run it as a paid ad at the beginning of YouTube yes. videos. So that ultimately is what, what did it. So Amazing. what we're doing now are it's direct response video advertising on YouTube. And I want to stress the direct response piece. Uh, Sean, are you familiar with the difference between- I Please, no, please, so, Ed, please go. All right, so if you're watching TV in the afternoon and you see a Coca-Cola ad, that's really a brand ad. They're yeah. hoping that when you get thirsty that you might think about having a Coke. If you're watching TV at night, you will notice that those ads tend to be different. They tend to be a bit longer and they're for people who are actually in the market for something. And yes. so they're considered, they're called from a marketing perspective, it's called bottom of the funnel as opposed to top of the funnel, meaning that they're actually in market for something. They're not just hoping you become thirsty. And those ads always have a call to action. So, you know, call now and we'll throw in this and this and this for free, right? Mm -hmm. But it's that call to action, it's that take action right now that gives it that name, direct response. So we are running these ads as direct response. So I run the same educational content and help them figure out what the best way is for them to get a website, which is, yep. by the way, not always jawful. We're Correct. clear about that. This for is sure. when it's not. We provide that content. And then at the end, we say, and by the way, if you have just discovered that Jotful is the best solution for you, why don't you click here? Call us now, right? We'll, yep. we'll talk to you about it. And then, you know, it leads them to a landing page and so forth. And we started to see that that was working. And so we started to double down on it. Well, instead of just having them call us right away, why don't we have a you know proper landing page where they can get more information? Yep. So we're not talking to every single person off the street, but really they're more they're qualifying themselves even further. And we just kept doubling down, spending a bit more, trying different audiences on YouTube, and then ultimately figured out that this is the way to grow. Now we've hired an ad agency to work on the creative and the media placement. We're hiring it. another conversion rate optimization firm who is working on optimizing the landing pages so we can convert more of those into appointments. So you can see how we started. I mean, I literally filmed the first videos on a wall in my bedroom, which is just like the wall that had like the most space, right? That's fantastic. And I edited them myself and you can see the evolution. Oh, and that happened over the course of about six to eight months. That's fantastic. I would love for you to share the story about the ad agency. I believe that you were talking about before we went live on our podcast, you were talking about trying to decide between two of them and they pre the way that they pre-qualified you and the way, the way that that made you feel. Yeah. <laughs> who you ultimately went with. 
Yeah. Because it's a big miss with digital marketing. It's a big, the hospitality piece is what I'm, we're relentlessly focused on is how do you use technology in a way that makes it a memorable moment? Because Mm -hmm. if it's a memorable moment, if you have that Amazon Prime one click, like that's a great experience. I've I've never talked to anyone from Amazon. Nobody has, (laughs) you know, you're like Amazon has built this digital hospitality experience that is phenomenal. And how do we do that in small business? How do we do that in service? How do we do that with products? I mean, this is the relentless pursuit to find out who's doing it right. And you went Mm -hmm. through an experience of somebody that wasn't doing it right. Yeah. So when I was looking for conversion rate optimization agencies, I talked to a a whole bunch of them, but two on the same day that really stood out in part because they were so different. The first one that I talked to, he provided tons of educational advice. He was prepared for the call. He had been on the landing page, which I provided in advance because I wanted them to be prepared for the call. He'd been on the landing page and the first 15 minutes or so of the call was him giving me advice on what I could do myself to improve the landing page without even hiring them. Right. Right. And it was super valuable and I really appreciated it. And he didn't try to sell me at all. And in fact, he's written a book and he sent me a copy of the book. I got it in the mail this past week. I confirmed with him that I received it. He said, let me know how it goes. He made me promise that I would read it before he sent it to me. And I'm, I'm, I'm sold on this, this firm, even though I haven't officially hired them yet. Then I talked to another agency later that day. And instead of putting me in touch with us, uh, somebody who actually had the kind of expertise as this, this first person did, they had me go on this qualifying call with an inside sales rep. This guy provided zero advice about my website. His entire job was to determine whether or not I was qualified to work with their agency. So he asked me the most basic questions. And Sean, I I don't want to be like, you know, (laughs) I'm some sort of marketing goddess or anything, but go to my LinkedIn page and you can see that I have been the head of marketing at multiple companies. Why are you asking me basic questions to determine whether or not I know anything about marketing, right? That's the one of the biggest fails that I see in Mm -hmm. this day and age is how easy it is for a sales team. And I don't care what you're selling to literally do a Google search on Mm -hmm. whoever you're calling or whatever business they're in. And literally the better the business, the more content that's going to be available. And literally whatever we're working on, whatever we're doing, guess what? We've probably podcasted about it. We probably created Mm -hmm. a TikTok video about it. There's probably a blog post about it. Like we are as open as and transparent as possible. So if you're a technology, hospitality technology company, and if you're listening to this, thank you for doing that. Uh Number one, like, please don't put that, like improve your hospitality, improve your hospitality with your due diligence Mm -hmm. and that due diligence that you do brings that memorable moment, makes you feel like may, maybe this person, if they care enough to do their homework, if they care enough to show up on time, then maybe they're going to care enough as me as a client, because mm-hmm. I'm going to be giving them money. Yeah. Yeah. And really just walk through what the entire experience with your company looks like. And I think people in hospitality are naturally going to be better at this maybe than people in other industries, but in hospitality, you're really thinking through every single detail of the interaction your, your customer has with you, you know, down to what's it like to be sitting in the seat? What's the lighting like? Um, when, when does somebody come up to the table, right? Like every little step, step of that, I think every company should be looking at it like a hospitality business and thinking about that whole process, because guess what? I didn't even speak to anyone who had any knowledge about conversion rate optimization at that company. And I wrote them actually just yesterday to tell them, no, thank you. I never even bothered. But that's, I mean, that, that's the amazing thing. And uh, you said it beautifully. And that's the thing that I teach restaurant owners is we understand hospitality. That is our business. Yes. That is our core mm-hmm. business. Mm-hmm. We do that. That's literally what gets us out of bed is to take care of other humans. We do mm-hmm. it so well in real life, but what needs to happen is transferring those principles that we do, taking yep. care of what the parking lot looks like, taking care of what the sign looks like, taking care of the music, taking care of the ambiance, the plate, the uniforms, literally all these details and the steps of service that nobody, typically you don't know, but all yeah. the places that you go to, I guarantee you, they do all of those things well. All otherwise through. you wouldn't be yep. going otherwise you wouldn't be going through that but mm-hmm. if on the digital side the digital businesses that will win will understand that customer path yes yep absolutely
You got it, Sean. So tell me uh, a little bit about the the businesses, the the different type of industries that you work with and some of the successes and some of the challenges, because you work with anybody from coaches to contractors, builders, farmers, ranchers, law yes. firms, trainers, tutors, instructors, creators. I mean, you have a plethora of industries that all need websites. I mean, yeah. If you are a if, if you want to sell anything, you have to have a website. You can't just have a Facebook page. You can't just have an Instagram account like mm -hmm. that is a fail safe way to lose. Yes. You have to play the long game and the sustainable long game is to find someone like Don, someone like Mithril Media, who we who built our website, but mm -hmm. find these professionals, these hospitality professionals, these digital hospitality professionals that can essentially build your new business into the future. Yeah. Yeah. So our, our customers are small businesses with owners who are not marketers. That's pretty key because once you have a marketer on staff, you're going to want to do a ton, a ton, a ton of changes. You know what I mean? You're going to want to be testing things Those all marketers. the time because <laughs> that's what marketers do. That's what marketers do. <laughs> you're going to be changing stuff all the time. You're going to yeah. be iterating. Like that's, it's not really what, what Jotful does, right? You know, yep. we are obviously it's ongoing and it's iterative, but it's not the kind of testing that you're going to expect to do with a market. It's really built for business owners who need marketing help, right? Yeah. And need somebody to help them with that online presence. So our customers tend to be fewer than five employees, companies with fewer than five employees, and primarily service-based businesses as opposed to product businesses. Because if you're exclusively a product business, what you really need is an e-commerce platform. Yes. Like Shopify or something, something like that. We do some commerce, of course, but it's not a full on e-commerce platform where you're going to be updating your inventory levels and all that kind of stuff on a regular basis. So that's, that's to give you an idea of who our customers are. Yeah. About half of them or a little more than half fall into the general category of professional services. So mm -hmm. life coaches, gosh, we have a lot of life coaches. <laughs> there's a lot of, if you go on clubhouse, there's a lot of life coaching going on. That industry is just <laughs> exploded. Yeah, definitely exploded. Yeah. So a lot of people, you know, management consultants, even marketing consultants, right? They just, yep. they're not web developers. Um, so all of these different kinds of professional services providers. And then, oh, and by the way, a lot of like home people. So power washers, people who come yep. to your house and wash the outside of, wash the outside of it. And then we have a lot of kind of what we call more main street companies. So custom cake decorators, bridal, bridal shops, of course, like, you know, the people that you maybe think of when you yep. think of small businesses. So it's really a mix. And I have to say, it's actually one of the more fun things about working here at Jotful. Our designers say it all the time that they just love the diversity of companies they get to yes. meet and the diversity of business models. Because on the call, on the very first call that we have, we ask, what is it that you want your website to accomplish for your business, right? It helps us figure out what the call to action should mm -hmm. be. And very often it's something like, we want people who come here and are qualified to book an appointment with us, or yes. we want them to buy this book that we're selling or whatever it is. And it gives our team an opportunity to see how all of these different businesses make money. So it's actually a really, yes. really fun um, aspect of working here is to get to interact with all these different companies. That's it's it's so fascinating to me once you're a digital business that's building literally the 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 revenue generating side for these businesses, mm -hmm. but then you can work on the story. And what impresses yeah. me is how well Jotful does at telling their story. So mm -hmm. many digital marketers, so many website companies, they don't do a good job of it, especially software. Once you start getting into software, I know it's more complicated oh, to yeah. tell your story, but yeah. You guys do a phenomenal job. Is was nice. that your was that your work? I mean, that's yeah. Donald Miller's story brand is one of the favorite my favorite books, and he does. Me too. It, yeah. Isn't it just a phenomenal book? Okay, we recommend it all the time on all yes. the podcasts because it's it's that important. I don't care if you care nothing about websites, which you should, and mm -hmm. that's why you're listening to this podcast. But from a branding perspective and a yeah. and just understanding that we're telling a story, and you need to tell a powerful story quickly. Yeah. Okay. So, so because I know that, you know, that book, um, do you remember our, our, our logo has our yes. name Jotful, but it also has this llama mascot. I have seen that. And when we first started, we just had the word Jotful, but I really felt like it needed a mascot. And I really felt like this mascot needed to convey the fact that we're really friendly. I would, if there's one brand attribute for Jotful, it's friendly. 
Yes. But we wanted to be friendly and, and smart. And I really thought it needed to be a character, but not a human. And that's how we sort of landed on an animal. Anyhow, I had this idea that we probably need some kind of mascot. And then I read that book, Story Brand. And in the book, of course, they talk about the hero's journey. That's what the whole book is about. Yes. And about how your cus- you this is the mistake most businesses make is they think that they're the hero, which is wrong. Yes. The customer is the hero and you are the mentor and your job is to help them solve whatever it is they want to solve or accomplish whatever they want to accomplish or achieve the transformation they, they seek. And you're the guide, really. And it was really this concept of, of the guide that got us thinking about what this mascot was ultimately going to be. And we came up with a llama because for so many small business owners, getting a website feels like climbing a mountain. Yes. And they just look and all they see is this steep incline and they have no idea where to start. They yes. don't know what equipment they need. They don't know how long it's going to take. And so for many of them, paralysis ensues. And we said, we really want to be the guide and llamas are often, you know, hiking up mountains. Yes. So we created this llama specifically to help the, the customer up. And we took it seriously we Sean, we spent a year on that mascot. Amazing. That is we did amazing. it seriously. And guess what? It has just paid off for us. We yeah. were just at this outdoor event last week. I can't tell you how many people come up to our booth because of that mascot. Yeah. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. I just love it. What do you guys do? Yeah. All the time. All the time. Uh, I mean, brand is so important. That mm-hmm. book is so important. We'll put a link in the show notes, um, make sure that people listen to it because for us too, I mean, we're a barbecue media company. We have a podcast, we have a blog, we have educational yep. content, but if you confuse, you lose. If you go to Cali yes. media, we sell barbecue. It yep. is clear as day. Like mm-hmm. the problem with barbecue is it takes time and it takes expertise. If yes. you want barbecue, buy barbecue, order it for pickup, order delivery, order for takeout. And that's it. Like, Mm -hmm. don't make it more complicated than it has to be, because not everybody wants to know the craft side of how we made our barbecue. Not everyone wants to know behind the scenes how a website is made. They just need Mm -hmm. to have an online presence and they need help with their story. Um, Mm -hmm. So at at the end of this podcast, I'd love for you to just give anybody that's listening that has a current website, any kind of tips that they can do immediately following this, that they can, you know, look at it with a critical eye that maybe they can uh, improve their site, improve their story brand. Yeah. So look, when people come to your website, the first thing they want to know is, is this for me? So on your website, is it clear? Are you stating who you're for? Because they're, they're going to, they're going to leave if they don't think it's for them. So make it super, super clear whether or not it's for them. And then be super clear about what it is that you do. Why do I, as a visitor, want to stay on this website? What, did it, what is it that these people do? And then finally, make sure that you have a very clear call to action. I mean, if you go to the homepage of our website, you're going to see the same call to action repeated about 10 to 12 times on yep. the homepage. And just over and over and over again, you get very clear that the next thing you're going to do is you're going to click this button and um, you're going to request a free sample website if you work with Jotful. And just make it really, really clear what that call to action is. People don't want to skip around. People don't want to just not know what the next step is because then they're not going to progress in your funnel. That is amazing. So every Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on Clubhouse, we do a digital hospitality room. Hopefully, Don, we can get you on one of those rooms um, before mm. the end of the year mm-hmm. um, to talk to other small business owners about a little bit deeper dive into what we've what we've talking about today. Um, we're going to put links in the show notes. Stover, Toby, part of my team. George is now on our team. He's creating social clips. So we'll get those out to you guys. You can always reach out to me, Sean at CaliBBQ.media. Follow me at any of the platforms. We're always available. Don, what's your favorite digital playground? How can people uh, connect with Jotful? Yeah, you can follow us on LinkedIn. So Jot, Jotful on LinkedIn is a great place to catch us. Otherwise, just uh, go to our website, Jotful.com. It's J-O-T-T-F-U-L is how you spell it. Beautiful. Well, Don, thank you for your expertise. Thank you for empowering small business owners. We love what you're building. We can't wait to see what you're building and support you along the way. Um, It's been a pleasure of mine to be on your show. Uh, Thank you for adding value to all all of our all of our listeners. We're super grateful. Stay curious, get involved, and don't be afraid to ask for help. We'll catch you guys next week. 